All right, we're going to dig right in here. Proverbs 22, at verse number 1. The Bible reads, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. A good name is something, again, that these, these days seems to be going by the wayside. Having a good name, where you care about who you are and how people view you as far as when you say something, does it stand? When you say something, can people say like, Oh yeah, you know, Pastor Burzens, he's just a big liar. He's just, you know, what does your name mean? Are you known as someone? It's basically, how are you known? We're talking about a good name. How are you known to people? Are you dependable? Are you honest? Are you trustworthy? Are you someone that, that sticks by your word? Because the Bible says that's, that's much rather to be chosen. That's a much better choice to, to look for the good things, have a good name, than to go after riches. And, you know, we've seen a lot of Proverbs also about people who use deceit and, and other ways to trick people and, and through wickedness get their gain. You know, obviously, uh, you're not going to have a good name when you participate in those types of activities. You want to make sure that what you're doing is good, it's honest, and uh, you're, you're earning your way uh, in, a, in a rightful way. And um, it's important to have a good name. Look at verse number two. The Bible reads, The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. It's saying, look, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, God's made all of us. And hey, if you're rich today, don't lift up yourself and think yourself higher than you ought to. Don't think of yourself and exalt yourself real highly because you have all these physical goods and look down on those who don't have as much as you. And on the flip side, you know, if you're poor, if you, if you don't have very much good, Hey, remember that God has made you, you know, both of you, you don't have to think any less of yourself than, you know, as someone who's got all this money. You know, people look up to these millionaires and say, oh man, they got so much money. And they, just, they give them all these extra, you know, accolades and stuff. And it's like, look, God made both of us. Now, I understand you could give credit to someone who's worked real hard and, and earned a certain degree of the way. But at the end of the day, they're not better than you. You know, they, they might have achieved certain things, but we need to make sure that we don't get this high-minded attitude if you do have money or thinking, you know, giving respect to persons unto someone else based on what they have or what they don't have. Look at verse number four real briefly. The Bible says, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. God wants us to be humble. And ultimately, that's what that verse two is teaching us. You know, hey, there's rich, there's poor. God's the maker of all of them. Be humble. And fear the Lord. You, need, you don't need to worry about what other people are doing. You need to be worried about how much money anyone else has. You need to worry about fearing God and doing what He has for you to do. The riches, honor, life, that's all going to come as a result of you being humble and you serving the Lord. If we look at verse number 3. The Bible reads, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Oh, a prudent man, they're going to see in advance the, the, the evil that's coming. You know, evil is, is harm towards other people. They're going to see, be able to recognize a cert, you know, certain situations and say, you know what, I'm just going to get out of here. I'm going to have nothing to do with this. Maybe there's people you know, plotting some kind of wickedness or, or you know, doing something in advance. A prudent man, a wise man is going to be able to see, you know what, I want have anything to do with this. I'm going to just hide myself, get out of the way, and I can see that this is happening and, and to move out of the way. But when you're simple, when you're, when you're unlearned, when you're unwise, you're going to get yourself involved in a lot of situations where um, if you had a little bit more wisdom, you'd be able to just get out of there. And it says here, too, you know, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. You don't need to go involving yourself in every wicked thing that's going on. Say, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to stop this and be, be a hero to just stop all the evil in the world. You know, sometimes it's wise, to, you know, it's prudent to just see, hey, this is a bunch of wickedness. I'm not going to have anything to do with that. I'm just going to, I'm just going to stay away from that and, and you know, fight some other battles or whatever and not, and not have to just get involved and get in the way of whatever evil that you're able to foresee. Uh, verse number five, the Bible reads, Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. And then verse number six, the Bible reads, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And I want to spend a little bit more time on this, this verse and verse number 15 this evening because this is an extremely important uh, uh, teaching in Proverbs and it comes up in multiple places in the book of Proverbs but here we're seeing you know train up a child in the way he should go and unfortunately these days there's a lot of people that aren't putting in a lot of parents I should say that aren't putting in their effort into training up their children 
And the Bible tells us, and, and it's clear throughout Scripture, that you know, God is the one who's blessed you with children if you're a parent. You know, God has given you that responsibility, and God has given you the, the, um, <clears throat> the um, responsibility to train up your child. Sorry, my brain just went completely dead. God has given you the responsibility to train up your child. And the Bible says, train up a child in the way you should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So if you invest the time, if you, if you decide that I'm going to do things right, hey, it's going to pay off in the end. You don't need to worry about how your children are going to turn out when you invest the time in training up a child. Child rearing, first of all, is more than just discipline. You know, discipline is extremely important. We're going to get to that in just a minute. But training is a lot more than just discipline. See, uh, in, in churches like ours, you know, we, we definitely emphasize the rod of correction and the, the discipline, the spankings, the, you know, the, 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 the proper punishment because people have gotten soft with that these days. But it's, that's, that's, that alone isn't good enough at all. If you're going to train a child, they need to have time investment. They need, you know, training is a lot of work. And I don't care what you're doing. I mean, you think about just training in general. You're training for, you know, f physically. You're working out. You're, you're training for a, a race. You're training for anything that's coming up. It's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be a lot of time. It's a lot of investment if you want to be successful in that training. It requires a lot of repetition. It requires, you know, the patience, the time, all of it. It's a big investment. And it's one of the most important things you could do in this life is to train up a child. Never forget that. I know that we lead busy lives. And this is in the Bible for a reason. Look, we need to take the time to train up our children. I know you've got other activities. I know you've got other house chores. I know you've got other things going on that could distract you and take your attention. But if you have children, one of the most important things that you can do, and especially the mothers, Train up your children. Training is going to be teaching. It's going to be a lot of teaching, a lot of education, a lot of explanation, a lot of showing the right way, and a lot of doing the right way and being really involved in your child's life. Look at verse number 15. The Bible reads, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Both of these verses, training up a child in verse number 15, uh, both have to do with raising children, with rearing up your children in a godly way, right? The first verse is more of a positive, training up a children. That's the, that's the, the doing all the good, all the explanation, all the teaching, all the things that, that you need to do to train them, to help them along the way. But verse number 15 is to deal with more of the negative consequences. The Bible teaches us, look, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Little children do all kinds of foolish things. And why does anyone do anything foolish? Because they lack wisdom, right? The, the, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The, foolish, the, the foolishness of this world is, is when people do things because they just simply don't have the wisdom. Usually it's because they're ignorant. They don't know any better. And that's definitely the case when it comes to children. They don't know any better. So when you got a, a child that gets a fork and they're going over to the, the electric socket, hey, it happens. I was there. I did that thing with like a paper clip or something. Psst. See what happens. Why? Because I was foolish. Because I was a child. Right? Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. All children are going to do foolish things. It's going to happen. The Bible tells us, look, it, that's the way it is. It says, but... The rod of correction shall drive it far from him. This is one of the main reasons why I believe wholeheartedly in spanking children and giving them that form of discipline, not just a timeout, not just a grounding, not removing things from them, but literally a spanking, a bare butt spanking on their behind to, to, to drive away the foolishness from them. You see, children, because they're foolish, because they don't have wisdom, you can't reason with them. You know, a man of understanding, we saw this in, in chapters past in Proverbs. You could reason with a man of understanding when, when someone does something wrong, because look, we're all sinners. When I do something wrong, you could reason with me about why what I did was wrong, and I could repent without ever having to feel some physical pain to change my behavior. You can't do that with little kids. You could try to do it, but good luck. That's not going to stick with them. But you know what does stick with them? The belt, the rod of correction, the, the, wow, wait a minute, I remember the last time I did this, and it wasn't very pleasant. 
I remember what happened. That sticks with them. That is going to drive away the foolishness. And obviously the goal is you, you, start, you start young. You start, you know, obviously not, not like infant or something when, you know, they don't understand anything. But when they start to understand right from wrong, when you could tell them no and they understand what you're saying and they go and do stuff anyways, you start with the, with the discipline. And the goal is the older they get, the less is required, right? The more of just the, 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 the speaking discipline and the, or the speaking corrections can be utilized and not just the, 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 the correction. But I think this is people are going way too soft on the subject of spanking today. And the trend is, is going in such a way that I believe pretty soon in this country a spanking is going to be illegal. You see people have already are they're constantly trying to introduce legislation it's been, you know, and, and it gets beat at this point, but it's going to happen. And it's just like anything else, though, with the rights that we have in this country right now, the parents have rights to spank their own children. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. Now, you might have noticed something a little bit different today because I'm going to make an analogy. I'm, I'm open carrying a firearm. I'm pretty maybe like, why does Pastor Burzons have that gun on his head? Well, I'll tell you what, Pastor Burzons almost always has a gun on him at some point, whether you know it or not. But what I'm doing today, I'm, I'm trying to make an illustration and make a point. Because I believe in open carrying firearms, and I believe it's actually important to do. Now, most of the time, I will conceal when I carry. And that's for tactical purposes, just because I'd rather not have somebody realize that I have a weapon if there's someone out to do evil. You know, I kinda, I'd rather be able to get the jump on them, right? It's just for strictly tactical purposes. But there's many good reasons to open carry. And I think the biggest reason is because so many people get freaked out by it these days. People don't understand. And, and it is. It's, it's a shock. It's a shock to your system. And I remember personally, okay, I moved out here from, from Chicago. I remember the first time that I was in a Fry's shopping center, right? Just a grocery store. And I walked by and here's this guy. He's got a gun on his hip, basically just like mine. It was, a, it was a, like a Glock or something, right? This is what I got. And I was just like, Whoa. I was shocked. Like, I'm, I'm like looking around like, does anyone else see this? This guy's got a gun. Like, like can you do that? You know, is that? <laughs> and, and it was weird for me. I mean, I grew up in, I mean, Chicago, yeah, it's like the, the, the People's Republic of, of Chicago, right? It's, and I, I can't even say, Illinois is not even that bad, but Chicago is horrible. The only people who had guns in Chicago were, were gangsters and the gangsters in blue. Right? I mean, that's it. There's two gangs, or you know, all the rival gangs. Because up there, the, 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 the police officers were, were a gang, too. I mean, it's gotten that corrupt and that bad up there. I have no problems calling them that. But um, that's the way it was. And, and so I wasn't used to it all. We didn't own a gun. You know, I never had a gun. I, I shot a gun one time at a friend's house. thought it was real cool. But you know, coming out here, it was just it was like, whoa, a culture shock. You know? But it's important because what happens is the further people get away from these things, and look, your Second Amendment right, your right to bear arms is extremely important. I mean, it's in the, you know, our, you know, the Constitution for a very good reason as number two. Number one and number two, very, 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 very important rights that we never want to forget and never you know, downplay the importance of them. We need to be able to defend ourselves by any means necessary. We need to be able to use firearms. We need to be able to do these things. And see, the thing is, when, people, when, it, when it goes off the radar and people just get real comfortable, you know, even well-meaning people, the people that, are, that hate it, the people that hate the guns, the people that hate your rights, the people that hate freedom, are constantly trying to get rid of it. They're constantly trying to restrict your freedom. They're constantly trying to, get, to, to, to pass legislation and do all these things. And... The more it's just kind of like out of everybody's minds and just no one's ever even thinking about it, the easier it is to get this stuff to pass through. And the de you know, it, the basically people get more sensitive to seeing a firearm when you don't see them at all. Then you become real sensitive to it. And when you open carry, you exercise your right, because we have the right to open carry. I have the right to carry this girl. In case anyone here didn't know, I think everybody does. This is perfectly legal and fine, and actually there's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. There's nothing wrong with it biblically, and there's nothing wrong with it according to our government either. Both are absolutely fine, and even our government uh, lets us know, even though I think at this point it's just lip service, that these rights are given to us by God anyways. This is not a right that's granted to us by the government. This is a right that's, that's, that God has given to us 
that the government just recognizes as being a right. So you know what? Yeah, these, these rights, everybody has these rights. They're human rights. And scripturally speaking, you know, I'm not going to turn there, but Jesus Christ himself said to his disciples, he was saying, you know, when you were with me, did you lack anything? And they're like, no, you know, like, I sent you out. You know, I told you not to take two coats. I told you not to bring your prayer. You know, I just said, you know what, go out and preach and whatever, you know, wherever you end up, just stay there. Whatever they feed you, just eat that. Everything was just completely fine. When I was with you, that's what happened. He says, but now I'm leaving. And now it's time, you know what, you do need your coats. You do need your coats. You know, he says, and, and um, he said, if you don't have a sword, you know, sell a garment and make sure you've got a sword. And they're like, you know, we've got two or whatever. And they're like, he's like, that's enough. It's fine. But Jesus even told them to be able to have a sword to be able to defend themselves. He said, you know, he's sending you forth as, as sheep among the wolves. And we need to realize that. And that is something that is, that is completely legitimate to be able to defend ourselves against wickedness and against evildoers. There's nothing wrong with that. But how does that tie in with this? Well, when you don't use your rights, when you don't just kind of show that, you end up losing them. And the way that I want this to, to sink in is that these days, spanking children has become really looked down upon in general and in the public eye. Okay? People don't want it. Now look, when you spank a child, it can be a little bit uncomfortable to be around that. I understand that. It's not a pleasant thing because, you know, a child starts crying and they're getting punished and, and it makes you feel maybe a little bit sympathetic. Oh man, that's too bad that they're getting punished, but it's definitely important. It's definitely something that needs to be done. It's definitely something the Bible teaches us that needs to happen. And just as much as I believe that there's a, time, there's a time and a place for everything. There's times that I think open carrying is great and should be done. There's also times I think concealment is, is, is important too and you should probably go that route. Well, I also believe that when you discipline your children, there's times when it's appropriate to be a little bit more discreet, to go and, and, to, and to, you know, go into another room, go somewhere else when there's people around, you know, kind of be discreet about discipline your children. Okay, and I think that's very appropriate most of the time. And one of the biggest reasons I think that's the case is because the children don't necessarily need a public shaming to be just disciplined in front of everybody. Usually, they just need to be to get their correction, and that's it. But you know what? Sometimes it's necessary. And I think in order to teach a child right, when they start doing something that's bad or that's wrong, that's like it needs to be dealt with right away, especially when it's really bad. Like the kids that throw themselves on the floor in Walmart or whatever, and they start throwing a screaming, kicking tantrum and just yelling at the old, they need a spanking right away. And I don't care if you're in public. I don't, you know, they need to get disciplined right away because that's going to be the best way that you're going to correct them is by them receiving it immediately as opposed to something happening way later. Because when you discipline them way later, after it's already gone, they've already forgotten about that. The discipline needs to be happening in a timely manner. And you know what? Sometimes that needs to happen. And I think, you know, we ought not to be scared about doing that because what what's the biggest fear now? I know the biggest fear is say, well, maybe someone might call CPS on me. Someone might call and, and I, I might have the threat of losing my child because I'm disciplining them appropriately in public. But you know what? If you, if you are fearful of that, then you know what? We're definitely going to lose that right. It's going to be taken away a lot, a lot faster than you realize because still in this country, spanking your children is not a crime. And we need to make sure that, that you're not letting people get you afraid of consequences by doing what's biblical and doing what's right. And it's just like any other aspect of your life. Hey, you need to be able to do what's right without fear. We need to be able to obey God and, and follow His perfect ways without fear of what other people can do, for, do to us. And that's a big fear because that hits home real close. Look, I know that just as well as anybody else. I don't want to lose any of my children. I love them more than anything, and I know what happens in those foster homes when they get taken away. I know the abuse, and that, is the, that would be like the worst thing in the world that could happen to me, is to have my children taken away, or any of my children taken away. So it's a big risk, or you know, it's, a, it's a big um, weight on my mind, but at the same point, look, we need to be able to do this. We need to be able to exercise our rights and make sure... That, that, that this is out there and it's out in the open. And, you know, especially as Christians who know that this is what God's law says, that this is what the Bible says, this is what the book of wisdom is teaching us on how to train our children. When someone else is disciplining their children, don't look down upon them. Don't talk bad about them. Don't say like, oh, man, why are they, you know, why are they spanking their kid or why are they spanking their kid in public? Look, 
Praise God that they're disciplining their children. Because most children these days are, are not being disciplined at all and they're turning into monsters. They're turning into a, to a bunch of people that, that think there's no consequences for their actions. And you know what? When they're not disciplined as children, they're going to grow up thinking that way and thinking that, well, nothing bad ever really happens to me when I do what's wrong. When I disobey my authority. When I just go and do whatever I want to do. It's never really that bad. And ultimately, at the end, I think it, it goes even deeper into children having a harder time believing in a hell. That hell's even real. When they don't have the physical pain felt sensation as a consequence to their actions, they won't even... It's a lot harder to imagine that there is a place of, of such a bad punishment for, as a consequence of their actions. And it starts from that, from that young age, and, it, and it's really rudimentary and inside of us, that, that teaching and that training that you receive to understand. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important. That's why the Bible says uh, in Proverbs, we're going to get to that later in a future week, that uh, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. The Bible actually ties that in together of, of disciplining your children and use the word beat them with the rod. It's not, it's, you know, people try to, I, I've heard so many of these phonies out there that want to try to make excuses for what the Bible says and try to interpret it some other way and say, well, the rod is just, you're guiding them. No, the Bible says to beat them with the rod. I mean, it's not that difficult to understand unless you're trying to make excuses and, and make it say something that's politically correct as opposed to just what God's telling us is wise. We need to make sure that this is a part of our training and teaching of children, the proper discipline. And I'll tell you what, it works. And anybody who says it doesn't work, you're not doing it right. The Bible says a spare not for their crying. It is not pleasant, and I've said this before, it's not pleasant for me or for my wife to get out the spanking stick and to spank our children. I don't like doing it. She doesn't like doing it. And you know, it's a lot easier just to say, ah, oh, yell at them and, and just stop that, and, you know, whatever, and, and continue just going about what you're doing. It's more difficult to say, well, here's what we got to do now. Go get the, get the spank sick, hand out the, the, the discipline, and hear the crying, hear the, the screaming, hear the wailing, hear the gnashing of teeth, you know, everything that goes on when, the, when a child gets disciplined. And, you know, sometimes, you know, with my kids, we've had some of them where they just see it and they start freaking out and crying like they've already received the punishment. And it's like, I haven't even done anything yet. But these are the things that a lot of times parents just don't want to deal with. And you're going to ruin your children. You're not teaching them right. You need to be able to just go through with it and do it and that they'll realize too, you know, the world's not coming to an end. You're going to get punished. You're going to get disciplined. You're going to realize there's consequences for your actions. But once the punishment's over, you know what? Great. We're done. We can move on. And that's why I also believe that, that you know, this punishment is way better than the grounding. It's way better than, than any other form that's out there, the timeouts, because that just prolongs that whole time of punishment. Get it over with. You know, just, just you've done this. Here's the result. Boom. Done. Let's all move on and keep moving forward. Well, let's continue on here in the, in the chapter. Look at verse number... Um, Seven. Proverbs 22, verse number 7. The Bible reads, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. And this is something that I think we all need to, to pay attention to also. In, in the society that we live in, it's a very debt-oriented society where getting into debt is normal. Spending credit cards, spending on, on whatever else. Hey, I want to buy this now and pay for it later. And this, this instant gratification type of mentality of, oh man, I need this, oh, I want this, oh, I'm just gonna get it and we'll just put it on payments, we'll do this, we'll whatever. It is extremely unwise to get yourself into debt. It is, it, is, it is a horrible trap to get yourself into because usually the people getting into debt don't have that much money to begin with. Because if you did, you wouldn't put it in, you know, you wouldn't buy it on, on credit. You wouldn't go into debt for it. You'd just pay cash for it. Usually people get into debt when you don't have a lot of money. But the problem with that is you don't, already don't have a lot of money. And now you want something, you desire something, so you put it on, on a credit card. 
Well, now you already didn't have a whole lot of money to begin with. You got to be paying off this debt in addition to paying off all the rest of your bills and stuff. And what ends up happening is you dig yourself deeper and deeper and deeper into this hole where it makes it harder and harder and harder to ever crawl out of. And paying that debt back ends up is going to end up costing you and, and taking much longer than you ever anticipated. Because what happens? Something comes up. Almost without fail, you, you put something and say, well, here's my payment plans. I'll get this paid off in just six months, right? No big deal. I really need this now. I want to do it. I'll put it off. I got the plan set out. I can budget out six months. And then what happens after three months? Unforeseen problem comes up. Oh, no. What are we going to do now? I don't have any money. Well, well what can we do? We got to put it on debt, you know, and then you just kind of ends up snowballing. And the Bible tells us here the borrower, the borrower is servant to the lender. The person giving you the money, you become their servant. You have to end up now working and working just to pay them off. As opposed to, um, you know, where it says the rich ruleth over the poor. Instead of ruling, now you have become the servant. And getting in debt is very unwise. Now, there may be extreme circumstances when you have no choice. And look, I understand that. And especially when it comes to, like, medical issues, right? I mean, your health is very valuable. It's very important. And there sometimes comes times, and look, I I'm dealing with it also, where... We just, you need to go to an emergency room. You need to do something, and that is what it is. Okay? But the truth still remains. Hey, the borrower is going to be serving to the lender. That's what you're getting yourself into. But you need to realize that, you know, medical, okay, fine. I'm willing to sign up for that. I'll be a servant for my wife's health. I'll be a servant for my children's health. I'll be a servant for my own health, right? To, to just make sure that, that I'm not going to die or whatever, right? Whatever the case may be. But do you really want to be the servant for that TV? Do you really want to be the servant for that car or for that toy or for whatever, whatever it is? Fill in the blank that you're going to be going into debt for. You're just becoming someone's servant just, just to, to have that thing. And we need to get out of this mentality of, of uh, instant gratification anyways. Because that's only going to get you into trouble. Instead of worrying about me, 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 right, right, now, 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 I just need to get it now. Why don't you wait, save up the money that you planned on spending in the future, you know, to pay off for it anyways, save up for it and then, and then pay for it. That's a much wiser decision. You will go much farther in life as far as fi your finances are concerned if you could make that type of decision and, and be able to, to withhold and to control and, and be temperate in the things that you want and the things that you do by earning the money first and then paying for it as opposed to getting yourself into debt. Uh, look at verse number 26, Proverbs 22, verse 26. The Bible says, Be not thou one of them that strike hands, or of them that are sureties for debts. If thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? So it's saying, it's exactly what I was just what's teaching here. Look, if you don't have anything to pay, why are you going to become, a, you know, being a surety for a debt or striking hands? It's talking about making a deal where you're getting involved financially and saying, you know, yes, I'm, I'm promising I'm going to pay this back and make these payments or whatever, and you become their servant. It's when you become a surety for debts, for things that you owe, you're saying that, you're, you know, you're becoming their servant, essentially. And he's saying, look, if you don't have anything to pay, don't buy, don't get yourself into debt because then what's going to happen when you owe and you can't pay, they're going to come and take your bed away from you. It's like, at least you have your bed right now. Why don't you just keep your bed and not get yourself into this trouble of, of getting into debt? Save up and just don't, don't get into that situation. It's going to be much wiser for you. Uh, look at verse number 8 here in Proverbs 22, verse 8. He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. Verse 9, he that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. Having a bountiful eye, being able to, to, to look on things, and, uh, or look on others, really, and give, and give generously. The Bible says you can do that, you'll be blessed, giving your bread to the poor. God will bless you for that. Jump down to verse number 16, the Bible reads, he that oppresseth the poor to increase his riches, and he that giveth to the rich shall surely come to want. And want is to, is to become poor, to become in need. And he's saying, look, if you oppress the poor in order to, to just gain money yourself, and you, and you are oppressing them, or it says, it says, and he that giveth to the rich. Right? God's going to bless you when you give to the poor, when you give to, to, to feed the poor. But when you're just giving money like to all these rich people, 
you're going to be the one coming to poverty as a result of that. Look at verse number 22, Proverbs uh, 22, 22. Bible says, Rob not the poor because he is poor. Neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. For the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. And I was just bringing this up last week in Proverbs, how God's got a special place in his heart for the people who are poor. They've got no one to stand up for them, but you know what? That's why God will stand up for them. God is always looking for the underdog, for the little person, for the person who's getting beaten down to, to, to come in and to show his might. He, he is the one that brings vengeance, right? The Bible says, vengeance belongeth unto me, I will repay, saith the Lord. He's the one that, that makes right all of the wrongs. He's the one that's going to stand up. And hey, keep that in mind. You know, people who want to rob the poor, because they got no one to stand up for them except for God. And God will stand up for them. You can be sure about that. And you don't want to be fighting against God. Amen. The Lord will plead their cause. Look at, go back up to verse number 10. Proverbs 22, verse number 10, the Bible reads, Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out, yea, strife and reproach shall cease. I preached on that when we went over all the, the scorner verses. Look at verse number 11, He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips the king shall be his friend. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, and he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. The slothful man saith, there is a lion without, I shall be slain in the streets. And that, that verse always kind of makes me chuckle a little bit. You know, the lazy man is worried about this lion out. He's like, well, I can't even go outside. I mean, a lion might kill me, right? It's, it would be kind of like, well, you know, I can't, uh, I can't, I can't fly in an airplane because a, a terrorist might blow up the plane. It's probably like the same odds of a terrorist blowing up a plane as being eaten by a lion you know, even in, in Jerusalem or wherever, you know, the, they were at at this time. But the lazy person is going to look for any excuse, any reason not to go up and get up and actually get out and do something. And we need to make sure that that's not us. Don't be worried about excuses. And especially, this is based on fear. Because that's what he's worried about, right? There's, the, there's a lion out there. Oh, I might, I might lose my life. That's not the, the wise person who is avoiding evil, by the way. <laughs> we saw earlier the, 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 the wise person, the, the prudent who foresees evil and hideth himself. That is not the slothful man. Okay, this is, that, that's talking about a legitimate evil, like a real thing that's going to happen. This is something that is ridiculous and not going to happen or, or so, so, so small of a chance of anything happening. It's just, it's ridiculous. And we shouldn't have a fear either. See, being prudent isn't the same as being fearful. The Bible says that uh, the, only, the only righteous fear is the fear of the Lord. We're not to fear what man can do to us. We're not to fear what, you know, anything that can happen to us. We need to just do what's right uh, without fear. The Bible even says in, Re in Revelation 21.8, we use this verse all the time. We're out soul winning to explain uh, how any sin is worthy of the second death. Any sin is worthy of that lake of fire. In Revelation 21.8, the Bible starts off, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and sorcerers and whoremongers, you know, it goes on in the whole list, but the first one is fearful. Being fearful is enough to send you to hell because it's a sin. It's that you, we ought not to be afraid of anything except being fearful of the Lord. So um, that's something that I think often gets overlooked or overread. But go back and read Revelation 21.8 and you'll see it's the very first words, the fearful and unbelieving. Um, verse number 14. The mouth, of a the mouth of strange women is a deep pit. And that means it's a trap. So that the strange woman is someone who's not your wife, someone who's foreign to you. It says their mouth is a deep pit. They're laying a trap for you. He that is abhorred of the Lord shall fall therein. And that's an interesting verse. They're saying the person that's going to be falling into that trap is hated of God. Why would they be hated of God? Well, the person that falls for the, the mouth of the strange woman is going to commit an adulterous act or, or a, a, you know, fornication at the very least. And um, that is a sin, and that is a crime that God hates already in and of itself. And we need to make sure we're keeping ourselves from getting anywhere close to that. And someone who actually do, does that, you're abhorred of the Lord. And if you're already abhorred of the Lord through other, because of other reasons, because of other sins you have in your life, it's going to be a lot more likely that you're going to fall into that trap also. Sin, when, when you start leading a life of sin, you're going to find out that you're going to, 
You're going to get involved in other sins that you never intended on getting involved with to begin with. The more you start accepting and justifying and, and holding on to your sins, it's going to spread. It's going to grow. It grows like a cancer. It really does. It's a, you know, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. As soon as you start saying, this is okay and justifying yourself, watch out because it's going to multiply and it's going to grow into other areas of your life, again, that you never would have thought and, and, and aren't even looking for. And um, you know, maybe one day it'll, it'll progress into something like this where you, where you get, come in contact with a strange woman. But uh, let's keep going here through the chapter, verse number 17. Bow, read, Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge, for it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee, they shall withal be fitted in thy lips. Very, very important for gaining wisdom is having a humble heart. It says, bow down your ear. You need to lower yourself. You need to bring your ear down to the level to say, okay, I'm not going to have my head lifted up high. I'm going to bow down my ear. I'm going to listen to this instruction. I'm going to hear the words of the wise. I'm going to hear what other people have to say. Get wise counsel from somebody else to teach me. I'm going to apply my heart to knowledge. I'm ready to hear. I want to learn. I have prepared myself, prepared my heart. It says, for it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. The words of the wise, keep memorize it. Get this godly counsel in your heart. Keep it with you where you go. When the, when the wisdom is with you, then you will end up making the right choices because you have it with you. It says, they shall with all be fitted in thy lips. And when you have things memorized, when you have God's word memorized, it's going to come out of your mouth also. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And when you have God's word in you, that's what's going to come out. It's going to be righteous. It's going to be godly counsel. It'll be godly wisdom to be able to teach other people. But you need to be able to be on that receiving end to hear the words, apply your heart, bow down your ear, don't think that you know everything. And this, is, this applies to everybody. I don't care how long you've been going to church. I don't care how many times you read your Bible. I don't care where you've been and what you've done. You still need to be able to apply your heart and to bow down your ear to hear wisdom. Amen. Everybody needs to be in that boat, myself included. Okay, I don't know it all and neither do you. And we all need to recognize that, that we can all uh, be able to learn and to grow and to, and, to, and to gain some extra wisdom and to keep it with us when we retain it and be able to um, give that wisdom to others as well. Look at verse number 19. The Bible says, That thy trust may be in the Lord, I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. So the, the goal was, was getting, your trust, you know, getting your trust in God it says, I have made known to thee this day, even to thee, like all these things that he's writing. So the wisdom that's given is so you can learn to trust the Lord and, and rely on him. Look at verse number 20. Have not I written to thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. He's saying, I'm giving you all this counsel. I'm giving you all these excellent knowledge and these excellent words of wisdom so that you can know for certain. He's spelling it out, saying, this is, these are all God's words. This is all the wisdom. So you could know the words of truth. God's word, God's truth. And then you could use those words of truth to answer other peoples, to those, it says, to them that send unto thee. We need to learn and gain God's wisdom to be able to then turn around and give it back unto others and be able to provide an answer unto other people. We need to learn the words of truth and then be able to speak and give the words of truth also. Look at verse number 24. The Bible says, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Uh, keep your finger here in Proverbs 22. Turn if you would to Psalm 101. We need to be careful who our friends are, who we spend our time with, who we allow into our life because they will rub off on you. The people that you spend time with are going to rub off on you. And Proverbs 22 says, look, don't, don't be friends with an angry man because when you start making friends and hanging out with someone who's angry, someone who's, who's quick to wrath and quick to anger all the time, it's going to rub off on you. It says, lest thou learn his ways. 
The more you spend time with that, and you know what you're going to end up learning? Especially when people have like a, like a real big problem in their life, that's what's going to rub off the most on you. It's going to be the, the, the kind of what they're about. He says here, an angry man. This is someone who's known for their anger. Right? I mean, it's not just someone who gets angry every once in a while. We all get angry every once in a while. But an angry man is kind of, yeah, that guy over there, how you characterize that person, you're characterizing them as an angry man. Well, guess what's going to rub off on you? The way that they're characterized is what's going to rub off on you. They say, you don't want to learn their ways. We don't want to just be, be intemperate and in, in, in becoming uh, angry ourselves at the drop of a hat. Because, but if you hang out with people like that, then you will. And you need to be able to guard yourself to make sure that you're righteous too. And look, we're, it's human nature to pick up other things from, from people. I think I've said this story before, but I remember when I, um, when I was much younger, I worked in a hospital. I worked in a, in a kitchen. It was at the, the cafeteria, but I worked back like by the food lines, and I actually scrubbed pots. I washed, washed the pots and stuff uh, for a little while. And most of the people, almost all the people working there were black. Okay? And I was a white guy. And they were all cool. I, you know, I, I got along great with all the employees. But, you know, in Chicago, in the, you know, it was, it was south suburb of Chicago, in a hospital, you know, they talk different than I talk. They had, they spoke with like Ebonics. They were no kidding. But after working there for a long time, you know what? I started talking like that. Because that's all that was around me. And it just rubbed off. I mean, I didn't even realize it until sometimes I'd go back and go hang out with my buddies. And they're like, what are you talking about? Like, why are you talking like that? Oh, I don't know. Don't even think about it, right? It's just one of those things that it just rubs off. I mean, that's kind of a silly example. It wasn't, you know, it was no harm to, to, to the way that I was speaking. It's not like it was filthy or something like that. It was just, just using uh, different terminology and different phrases or whatever. But um, it's true that, the, that who you're spending your time around, they will rub off on you. And we need to make sure that, um, that we're spending our time around people who are going to be good influences on us and have good characteristics and good traits than, than people who are just... Um, you know, have, are angry man or whatever. Look at Psalm 101, verse number 2. The Bible reads, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. So here's David saying, look, I'm going to be wise. I'm going to walk in the right way. I'm going to walk in a perfect way. I'm going to walk in my house in a, in a, with a perfect heart. I'm going to do what's right. How is he going to do that? Verse number 3. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Why? Because the people who are doing the work of them that turn aside, people who are doing wickedness and not obeying God, and you start spending time with them, it's going to cleave unto you. What they do is going to stick on you when you're spending a bunch of time around them. He says, I'm not going to have anything to do with them. I'm not going to say a wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. Look at verse number four. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. He said, I'm not going to know them. They're not going to be my friend. Now, look, we all deal with sinners. We all deal with wicked people at some point in our life, just going out and being in the world in general. You're going to come in contact with wicked people, but that's not who you're going to be coming to know, right? To be your friends, to just saying, hey, I'm going to spend a lot of time with this person, and they're going to be my friend if they're a wicked person. David saying, in order for me to be upright and perfect in my heart and do what's right with God, I'm not going to know a wicked person. Verse 5, Whoso privily slandereth his, na his neighbor, him will I cut off. He's saying the person that's spreading rumors and, and, and being a gossip and everything else, I'm not going to be friends with them. I'm going to cut them off. Yep. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart, will not I suffer. Right. Don't be around the proud people. Don't be around the gossip. Look, spend no time with them. It's going to rub off on you. Then before you know it, especially with the gossiping thing, then everybody starts gossiping. You start spending time. You're going to be doing the same thing. And then the people you're spending, you know, it spreads. It spreads a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. We need to watch out for these things in order to walk with a perfect heart. Watch out for the proud people. Watch out for the angry man. Watch out for the, the slanderer. Look at verse 6. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land. This is who you should be looking to as your friends, as your companions. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that he, they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. 
who we spend time with, who we, we really choose to be our friends and to do things with, they're going to rub off on you. Make sure you're choosing someone. Go back if you go to Proverbs 22. Make sure that you're choosing somebody to be in your life that has good qualities. They're not known for their bad qualities. Look, and look, I know none of us is perfect. We all have our own, our own sins, our own flaws. But when you're known as a slanderer, you're known as a liar, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're a proud person, that's different. I mean, it, when people are known for that, don't spend time with them because it's going to rub off on you. You're going to pick up after their traits. It's going to cleave to you. And that's unwise for yourself to put yourself in that position to be around them. Now, there may be times where it's prudent to, let's say there is a wicked person, but they're unsaved, right? And you want to give them the gospel. Okay, you can go out to eat, you can go do something where you could give them the gospel, but they still ought not to be like your really close buddy or your friend that you're spending a bunch of time with, right? And if it's a, say, if it's a Christian, if it's someone that's called a brother, the Bible says not to eat with such a one. You know, there's many things that, that a person can do if they're a wicked person, you're not even supposed to be eating with them anyways. So just, just cut that out of your life and make sure that you're guarding yourself enough to keep your own walk with God upright. Uh, look at Proverbs 22, verse 28. The Bible reads, Remo Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. And this reminds me of Jeremiah 6, 16. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. The old paths. This is why we're an old-fashioned, fundamental Baptist church. We're looking for the old ways. We are, we are looking for the, the ways that are so old that they're coming straight out of this book. Amen. Ancient ways of, of God from everlasting to, to be the, the landmark. I mean, what's a landmark? It's something that's set up and, and display uh, one of the, a, land, a good idea of a, or a good um, example of a landmark is when the children of Israel went into the promised land and you remember how they they split up and uh, Reuben and um, Manasseh half the tribe of Manasseh were, were on the other side of the river and they, they got their inheritance over there and what they did was they built up that altar and the rest of Israel wanted to go and, and, you know, and, and kill them and say, man, I can't believe you guys did this. But they said, no, 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 we didn't build this to sacrifice here. We're not, we're not moving you know, the temple. We're not moving the tabernacle. We're not, we're not moving God's place of worship. We're setting this up. And what they're doing is setting up as a landmark. And so that, that way, when your kids grow up, you know, when we're dead and gone, and your kids grow up and our kids grow up, they can see, oh yeah, they believe the Lord too. And that was an ancient landmark that they were setting up to establish that had meaning, that was... That was um, that was established so that they could know, hey, we serve the Lord too. And that was one of those, those old, ancient landmarks that was set up for a very good purpose. And um, we need to, to make sure that we look for that and not, and not remove and not say, oh man, you know, the, the, the ancient, you know, the, these old-fashioned ways, what do they know? I know something new. I got something better. No. Don't remove the old landmarks. It's, when God says it's a certain way, we don't need to improve on it. We don't need to change it. Let's just keep doing things the way that, that he said and not remove the ancient landmark. Look at verse number 29. The Bible reads, Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Being diligent, being a hard worker, getting things done. The Bible says if you're like that, if you could be a diligent in your business, you'll stand before kings. You'll get a lot done. You'll get yourself to places of, of success, even just financially or, or in this world. You will achieve that level of success when you can just be diligent and work hard. It'll pay off. And that's a biblical concept. You know, we, ought not, we, we saw already in this chapter about being lazy, being a slugger, being slothful and worrying about some lion going to eat you in the streets and you coming into poverty. And we've seen that through many of the Proverbs already versus being diligent. Hey, you must stand before kings. That's, that's, that's getting to a pretty high level. Stay diligent. Don't be slothful. Don't get lazy. Don't let yourself, you know, don't let your eyes sleep and be given to slumber and just... Just be thinking about you know, all the rest and all the breaks and all the fun. Hey, work hard. It'll pay off for you. And we ought to work hard not just for ourselves and just being able to support ourselves, but work hard for the Lord. 
So be diligent. You work hard, you're diligent in your doings about serving God, one day you're going to stand before the king. And you get a well done, now good and faithful servant. But it's not going to come, it doesn't just come to anybody. I mean, just because you're a believer, yeah, you're going to heaven. But you're not all going to get the well done, now good and faithful servant. Be diligent. Be diligent in your work. Be diligent in doing and just working hard and keep pushing. Keep pushing forward. Press towards that mark. Look, our life here is short. The years that I've had already, my 39 years, they've gone really fast. And I'm sure anyone here could say it. And the older you get, the faster it gets. The, the, the less time you seem to have. And it's like, man, year after year after year, just gone. Be diligent in your work. Don't faint. Don't, don't fall down. Don't, you know, keep working towards God. It's going to be over before you know it. And you'll stand before the king one day. You'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And you'll have a lot of rewards for yourself if you can be diligent and not faint. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great instruction that we've received from your word tonight. I pray that you please help us all to, um, there's, you know, there's always so many different topics that we go into on these, these Wednesday night Bible studies through Proverbs, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to be able to absorb all the truth, especially the truths that are really pertinent in our own lives, the areas where we're individually lacking, dear God. Help us to be able to retain Retain these in our heart. Help us to receive these words of truth and that we could keep them in our hearts, dear Lord, that we can go forward and be able to be good, have good counsel for others and be able to make the right decisions within our lives, dear Lord. Help us to never be afraid or ashamed of the way that we discipline our children, dear God, but that we would be able to do so because we love them and we care about them in, in a way that's in accordance with your words, dear Heavenly Fathers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.